Hey there students, I'm going to go ahead and start belting out a lecture series that I probably should have done a long time ago. I'm going to get into World War I and in this lecture I'm going to focus on the causes of World War I and in other lectures I'll go into the weaponry, the psychological toll, some of the poetry and art and of course the Paris Peace Conference. But let's go ahead and start with the causes. Now, World War I ran from 1914 to 1918, and in the course of this four-year period, 38 million casualties, around 10 million of those deaths, just a level of destruction unheard of in history up to that point. And we ask ourselves, what started this mess? How did Europe go from 99 years of relative peace between the Napoleonic Wars and World War I into this war that was beyond anything that they'd ever seen? The war to end all wars, so to speak. Little did they know. Most people explain the causes of World War I by breaking them into four parts, going over the so-called main causes, which are militarism, alliances, imperialism, and nationalism. And that's the framework through which I'm going to explain the causes to you. Now, first of all, let's start with militarism. And this goes to the Anglo-German arms race. is really the biggest expression of this pre-World War I militarism. Starting with the HMS Dreadnought. That is quite a name, Dreadnought. And you already know this is something big. Even compared to all of these other ship names, the Arrogant, the Gladiator, the Unbeaten, Unbending, Unbroken, Undaunted, Valiant, Vampire, Vanquisher, Vehement, Vengeance, Victory, lots of Vs there, and that's only a few of them. The Dreadnought. That's just, wow. Okay, like this better be good. This is got to be a big ship and sure enough it was this thing loaded with 12 inch guns that's like 12 inches in diameter as far as the shells that this thing would put out and here is the deck of the dreadnought at least part of that's the deck and you can see a cross section and all of that kind of stuff and you see all of these different gun placements it is unreal this is beyond anything that had ever been made before you see that the industrial revolution has been fully realized You've got a fully automated loading mechanism. You see that sailor there that is just kind of like, all right, I'm just sort of watching this thing do its thing. And this is a killing machine. So much that it renders every other ship ever made obsolete. And what's important to note here is that Britain had had all of this naval superiority in the 19th century, but now that they've made this ship to end all ships, so to speak, now we're starting over at one. And if someone wanted to catch up, they could. Let's go ahead and look at this data here. When we look at 1870 and 1913 and we look at the manufacturing capacity of westernized nations. Now in 1870 of course the UK, that being Britain, etc. being the first to start the Industrial Revolution, they were still ahead. Behind them the United States and then behind them Germany. Fast forward to 1913. <laughs> Now we see that, whoa, <laughs> the U.S., America, whoa, <laughs> yeah, all right, more than Germany and the U.K. combined, but keep in mind that Americans are kind of still on that Washingtonian, Jeffersonian kick, sort of staying out of this thing, at least at the beginning, and when we look here, we see that in the intervening years between 1870 and 1913, Germany has surpassed the U.K. in manufacturing capacity. Remember, in my lectures on German unification how I noted that the unification of Germany fundamentally altered the balance of power. Now that Germany can outmanufacture Britain, there's nothing saying that they can't outnavy the British. And that is going to be the impetus for this arms race that perhaps we can catch up. And then relations between Germany and Britain weren't going so well anyway. Kaiser Wilhelm II, uh, whom the British sometimes called Kaiser Bill, 
And Kaiser Bill thought, well, I'm just going to give an interview to the Daily Telegraph, which is still a major newspaper in the UK today, and I'm going to go ahead and try to smooth over Anglo-German relations. Well, he does about the opposite. First of all, somebody asked him something to the effect of, hey, why all this military buildup? Are you trying to compete with the British? And he's like, well, yeah, what else would I be trying to do? And that's not really what the British wanted to hear. And then, instead of being cool about it when he's asked, hey, what about all this distrust between the UK and Germany? Instead of saying, hey, it's cool, man. This is just a misunderstanding. He says, you Brits are about as mad as a bunch of March hares. You are just crazy, all right? This is just crazy stuff. And so now, the British get in their biggest paper, one of the biggest papers, the Kaiser of Germany, who's saying that, Y'all are a bunch of crazy people, and of course, we're building up our military to compete with y'all. And this really did not go so well. So when you think, oh, I'm going to give an interview to smooth this over, doesn't always have the intended consequence. And then, of course, there are Franco-German tensions when we look at the Franco-Prussian War and everything that led up to that, and the aftermath where the Germans proclaimed their empire right there in the French Hall of Mirrors. They exacted reparations from the French after the Franco-Prussian War, and then they took the territory of Alsace-Lorraine from the French. So keep in mind, it's not just the British and the Germans, there's a lot of tension between the British and the French, well, of course, but the French and the Germans as well. Three nationalities that don't really like each other, except that Britain and France are going to be on the same side during this war. Next, we move on to the alliance system. Now, the alliance system was the byproduct of Bismarck. Bismarck, who was pretty much a foreign policy genius for the most part, and what Bismarck thought that he was going to do was to forge a system of alliances which would actually prevent wars. This is kind of a recipe for peace and a recipe for maintaining the balance of power through alliances. He made alliances with Austria-Hungary and with Italy, and then... France and the UK and Russia make alliances with each other. You've got two major alliances here. First of all, the Central Powers, Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Italy, which is then going to turn coat during the war, but then the Ottoman Empire will join the Central Powers. So for the purposes of the war, Germany, Austria, Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire. And then the so-called triple entente. Entente is a French word meaning something to the effect of understanding. The United Kingdom, Britain, aka France, and Russia. And the objective, remember, is peace. That Bismarck felt like the objective here is not to go to war. That if we have this whole pile-up effect or something like that, that look, if you mess with this one, you mess with me. If you mess with that one, you mess with me. I mess with you. You really don't want to get into a fight. If Austria is thinking about, ooh, let me pick on little Serbia and take Serbia's lunch money or something like that. Russia's like, NIT! And that's like, whoa, okay, like, yeah, when the Russians get like that, no, no. And then the Germans might get involved, and then the French and the British and all that kind of stuff. And you think about it, and you think, maybe not. Maybe I don't want to get into this big fight with a whole bunch of people, rather than just, just over picking on this one individual nation. And the thing about the alliance system is that it works, until it doesn't. Kind of like at a baseball game or something like that, where the pitcher hits the batter and then they get in a fight and then it all piles up and it gets out of hand. It's almost like nuclear war and mutually assured destruction. That works. It's worked so far. Until it doesn't. Next, we move on to imperialism, which I'm not going to stress a whole lot, but I do want you to think about imperialism in terms of national rivalry going global, whether it's the scramble for Africa, whether it's imperialism in Asia or in the Pacific Islands. What this does is it gives European nations another forum in which to compete, and this is going to escalate those national rivalries. And beyond that, I'm not really going to stress imperialism as a factor. Then there's nationalism, this whole idea of self-determination on the basis of ethnicity, that we as a people should be able to form our own country and associate with each other, whether it is uniting like Germany and Italy or whether it is dividing like a lot of folks in the Balkans 
nationalism is about determining your own course of action for your own ethnicity. And this is where we have to turn our attention to the Balkan Peninsula, which includes lots of countries, the former Yugoslavia, Romania, Greece, even a little bit of Turkey. But where we're really going to focus on is the so-called former Yugoslavia, these countries that after World War I were put together and just called Yugoslavia. I mean, after all, they, they can all be Yugoslavs, right? That's not really how it works. You've got Slovenians, Macedonians, Serbs, Croatians, all of these other people, Bosnians. You've got a lot of different people that are here that don't play well with each other. In fact, it, with all of the conquests ranging from the Byzantines to the Ottomans to the Habsburgs and all of these different groups who have different languages, different religions, different cultures, these people don't play well with each other. In fact, they are really fond of killing each other. Now, Miss Snyder went out to Croatia and the Balkans and all that kind of stuff over the summer. She seemed to be having a good enough time, but I don't want to go out there. That's just too many people who like to kill each other for me to go out there and you know be a part of that and all that kind of stuff. But she goes to Israel and all kinds of dangerous places like that too. So she can have that. I'll just stay right here in America. I mean, it looks peaceful enough. It's like, oh, look, waterfall, all that kind of stuff. But don't be fooled by that, okay? That is a tank. And this used to be the National Library in the 1990s. So they just gutted that thing, and this cellist uh, decided to play there in the National Library just to kind of show what's become this thing. So don't underestimate these people. Don't feel too safe over there because they're very fond of killing each other. Now, hopefully, I did not offend anybody over there if they're watching in the former Yugoslavia. That is not my intent. In fact, if you are offended, I'm happy that you're alive to be offended because that means that somebody has not killed you. It's been pretty quiet over there lately. Maybe one day I might go over there. Who knows? And this former Yugoslavia in the Balkans becomes a hotbed for what you would call pan-Slavism. Here is a map of Slavic peoples. When we talk about Slavic peoples, we're talking about the Russians, the Poles, and then all of these other people that are here in the Balkans who share language groupings, who share the Orthodox religion. A lot of these Slavs share a lot of elements of culture with Russia. And Russia has always taken an interest in this area. So it's very important to note these balance of power considerations. When you look at Serbia, for example, it is there on the border of the Austrian Empire, but they share this Orthodox religion with the Russians. They share this Slavic heritage with the Russians, and that's going to be important. And there's a group of Serbian nationalists known as the Black Hand. And these people want to liberate Slavs that are still in the Austrian Empire. And if you look at Croatia, at Bosnia, at these areas here, they are still being dominated by the Austrian Empire. And the Serbian nationalists would like for that to not be so. And they launch a terror campaign because they can't launch a standard military campaign against a great power, but they want to make a point. And in order to make a point, they are going to pretty much start World War I. Archduke Franz Ferdinand is an important guy to remember. He was the heir of the Austrian Empire. If the Austrian Emperor croaks, then he's the Emperor. This guy is a pretty important guy. Now why they sent him to where they're sending him, I have no idea. But they decide, you know what, let's send the Archduke to Sarajevo. After all, this old postcard here looks really pretty. Why don't you drive across that bridge? It might be fun. No, it's not going to be fun, but he's got a pretty cool car. It's like, let's just send you over there in a convertible. You can wave at people and they'll be happy. They'll love you and they'll be like, yeah, we want to be part of this big empire that really has nothing in common with us or anything like that because you got a cool car, man. It's not quite how it panned out. Instead, somebody shot him. He was the victim of a terrorist attack from these black hand Serbian nationalists. Ooh, gross. Okay, Richie, why'd you put that in there? That's because that's his shirt. He got shot. It's sort of like a relic. I don't know why they kept it, but still on display. If you ever wonder, I'd kind of like to see the shirt that he was wearing when he got shot. There it is. All right, that's it.
And this ignites all of these tensions that have been going on here. When you think about this arms race, the tensions between Britain and Germany, between France and Germany, all of the imperialism, the alliance system, that everything is going to go up. And the biggest war that the world has ever seen is going to start. And this web of alliances is activated that the Austrians declare war on Serbia. The Russians are like, oh no, you didn't. Yet. And then the British come in. The Germans come in. The French come in. The United States is like, no, not, not yet. But this is what starts the whole thing. And the bench clears. Now, one thing I'm going to tell you on the way out is that Major League Baseball did about the most genius thing I've ever seen. All of the fights that you've had, the big brawls and everything, you can go to their YouTube channel. Just put in like MLB brawls or baseball brawls or Nolan Ryan, Robin Ventura brawl. That's one of the classics. But any of these big brawls, MLB's decided, let's put them on YouTube and make some money out of them. So if your teacher's cool, Right now, you're going to, well, when the video's over, let me finish, okay? Respect, people. Right now, when I finish, you're going to look at some brawls. Maybe like two or three of them. Just to see, I mean, maybe your teacher's a coach and knows some of these, but it's such good stuff. Baseball is America's pastime, and it's kind of sad that it's sort of losing interest, although I love football. Anyway, the bench clears, and World War I starts. So again, the main causes, militarism, alliances, imperialism, and nationalism. The alliances, the Central Powers, Germany, Austria-Hungary, and the Ottoman Empire. Triple Entente, Britain, France, Russia. Italy's going to leave one, go to the other, to the victor, you know? Well, that's about it. Subscribe. TomRitchie.net, follow on Twitter and Instagram, like on Facebook, all of that good stuff. I'll be back soon to continue this lecture and kind of get into the war itself. But until then, I gotta go. Till next time.